Alright guys, it is a gray and gloomy but warm Monday morning here in the collapse of global industrial civilization here. What's left of the paradise of Garfield, Texas where I am back getting ready to sell my little shack on the floodplain because I am a climate <coughs> refugee and if you do not know where you are, you have arrived at Collapse Chronicles, and my name is Sam Mitchell. This is my little co-pilot, Sancho Panza, and here on this Monday morning, having my Save the Planet organic cup of coffee, uh-huh, doing what we every, do every day, and that is chronicle the collapse of a planet. So I am going to have the great pleasure and honor tomorrow of speaking to this woman named Karen Schrag. Karen Schrag, I'm really looking forward to this interview. She is a poet, a, an environmental activist. Uh, she, she understands that overpopulation is the biggest issue on the planet. So to help prepare myself for that interview and to whet your appetite for it, we're going to go over to Karen's website. No, you're going to stay. I know you want to get that squirrely, but the squirrely's up in the tree. You can't get them anyway. You need to stay. We're going to go over to Karen's website, and I'm simply going to read her last two essays from her blog called Moving Upstream. And we're going to start. This was her posting from February 18th by the numbers BYE by the numbers about the uh, this is about the conundrum of immigration and that loaded loaded subject okay take it away Karen <coughs> this February marked what would have been my grandfather's 125th birthday we call my father's dad Zadie he was born in Russia near Klesk in 1895, an unwilling Jewish soldier in Tsar Nicholas's army. He and most of his siblings sought a better life in the U.S. Not all made it here, which is why to this day I have cousins in Argentina. <clears throat> yes, I am a proud granddaughter of an immigrant. <coughs> But he and his relatives came here in the 1920s, back when the U.S. had a population of around 110 million and the world's population was just under 2 billion. U.S. immigration was limited in those days for a lot of reasons that most would not be proud of today. Anti-Semitism and a general xenophobia informed much of our policy and kept legal immigration to a more ecologically sane number, approximately 150,000. This century, the persecuted around the globe have increased. Their desperation runs deeper and their numbers climb higher. <clears throat> this is due to many factors, including global overpopulation, climate change pressures, the hangovers of colonialism and the ravages of the U.S. military industrial complex, which have kept developing countries in poverty. No one blames refugees for trying to get to a country of apparent riches. I am certainly glad my relatives were able to get in. I have unconditional empathy for those seeking entrance to a country which promises a better life, even though our racism and xenophobia roots have not disappeared. The trouble is, there's always a cloud in the silver lining. <clears throat> the trouble is, that due to exponential growth, medical advances, and a huge increase in legal immigration limits over the years, the U.S. 
has nearly tripled our population to an unsustainable 327 million. So has immig immigration policy. So has immigration policy stayed low to compensate for the higher population? No, it has not. At about 1.1 million, legal immigration has grown about sixfold. To be blunt, that is half-assed backwards. Our dominant story has followed the poem on the Statue of Liberty without any regard to the physical, ecological limits <clears throat> that are built into every country's landscape, including our own. Over a million new drivers, job seekers, and consumers of limited water supplies are now added each year because we feel it is our moral duty to absorb those in need. Our public discourse has shunned all conversation about bringing sanity back into our immigration policies. <clears throat> we need to stress that we also have a moral duty to preserve our fragile ecosystems. Officials in both political parties need to show some courage, integrity, and encourage this much needed conversation. All who care about this country and its environment should join in a chorus of reducing the number of legal immigration back to the days when my grandfather arrived in a ship to Boston Harbor. Policies need to reflect, for the, reflect the needs for preservation of habitat for wildlife and to protect our local natural resources. We believe, I'm sorry, we behave as if we expect to avoid congestion, large carbon footprints, water shortages, increased in solid waste and air pollution while adding over one million new consumers into our country. If we continue with current immigration policies, we can expect an additional 75 million Americans by 2060. According to Global Footprint Network, we passed our sustainable number at 150 million. Overshoot is here and eating away at our promises. If clean and available water, open space, less traffic congestion, and lower carbon footprints are truly valued, we must look to all sources <clears throat> of population growth and address them. Fertility rates and immigration are both causes of U.S. overpopulation. As such, they must both become a part of a civil discussion about how we address our problems at their source. My Zadie knew how lucky he was to make it to America and worked hard all his life to make better opportunities for his family. He made me respect the challenges all immigrants face and the way they must learn to fit into a prejudiced society. I wish I had the wherewithal to tell him years ago how much I appreciate the sacrifices he made so that my siblings, cousins, and I could grow up in the U.S. I also wish people realized that my Zadie and his peers lived during a time when we had a population we could have sustained. <clears throat> it is in our best interest to convince Americans and our leaders that we have long said goodbye to a number the environment in the U.S. can handle. So obviously we will be touching on this delicate issue of immigration. Just quickly, the, the question I want to ask Karen, you know, I'm, I'm just totally conflicted about this issue is because <clears throat> it doesn't matter where these people are coming from or where they're going. 
uh, we still share the same planet, so they're they're either <clears throat> stomping around with their environmental footprint and breeding on this side of some artificial border written across the landscape of the planet, or they're doing the same on the other side. Uh, th this uh, I, I want to talk to Karen about this. This is one of the things we're we'll talking about. Okay. And here's another uh, touchy subject. Karen does not, my, she has no problem uh, riling up, uh, riling up the lefties and the snowflakes to be brutal about it. I touched on this subject in the interview I just published yesterday with Joao Abigail. Uh, and when we were talking about this, he mentioned that Karen would be a good person to uh, so anyway this is Karen's essay from last from January why environmental moderates are more frustrating than outright climate deniers thank you Karen if your house was smoldering you could use water from a hose with weak pressure. If your house was just starting to burn, you would need to call the fire department. But if your house was being consumed by fire, you would need to sound all alarms and call in multiple fire departments. How many Gretas will it take for the majority of leaders and people to realize our house is burning down? How many moderate responses to an environmental catastrophe can we continue to tolerate? I am inspired by the words of Martin Luther King, who was very frustrated with white moderates, quoting MLK. Quote, I must confess that over the past few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in his stride toward freedom is not the White Citizens Council or the Ku Klux Klanner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace which is the absence of tension to a positive peace which is the presence of justice, close quote. That is exactly how I have felt about environmental moderates. They are our greatest stumbling block to doing right by the earth. Those who will not even discuss human numbers and how overpopulation is a driving force behind the flames frustrate me more than those who deny humans caused climate change. They never use their microphone for educating people how people are not going to survive if we do not stop converting the planet to a place just for us and our billions. MLK further said, quote, a white moderate is someone who constantly says, <clears throat> I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I cannot agree with your methods of direct action, who paternalistically believes he can set the timetable for another man's freedom. Such a person, close quote, such a person is, according to King, someone, quote, who lives by a mythical concept of time and who constantly advises the Negro to wait for a more convenient season, close quote. As a self-proclaimed and proud overpopulation activist, I have personally been told to wait to push this issue because other issues are more pressing well, waiting gets us to an additional one million passengers every four and a half days to find water for, clothes, house, feed, and employ. We are already 
at least five and a half billion overpopulated compared to our resources and the pollution resulting during their extraction. The environmental moderates who operate by a mythical timetable, one in which renewable energy and cloth bags will save us. Ultimately, King wrote that quote, shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection, close quote. Thank you, Martin Luther King. You just described perfectly how it feels to be in a world where most environmental organizations have a moderate approach to saving the world when you know it is like bringing a garden hose to a house fire. And I'm just going to read two paragraphs from one of her essays last year titled Entrenched in a Sea of Inertia. In our world of declining non-renewable resources, inertia seems to be a renewable and infinite resource on any number of issues. Those of us who love reading and learning often think education is the best tool for moving the needle on the inertia scale. Activists on any number of issues, however, would beg to differ. They are frequently disappointed with their results when fact proliferation is their only tool. Change is hard and complex. <clears throat> so this is uh, Karen Schrag's definition of the ingredients for a seismic shift. The ingredients for a seismic shift on entrenched problems need more than information. I propose that the recipe for radical social change has to include at least the following. Number one, evidence that is provable by many sources. Number two, a tragic event or incident that attracts national or internet, international attention and is intimately and inextricably linked to said evidence. Number three, coalitions representing multiple voices from various political groups, gender and racial groups, speaking up in a unified voice and messaging with demonstrations, speeches, and writing. Number four, opposing views are dismissed as being fundamentally unfounded and its leaders exposed for being self-serving in some way, either for money or power to the detriment of most people and the environment. Number five, a way out. Direction offered to change behavior that is acceptable to most and doable by enough people to make enough of a difference. And of course, it is number five where uh, the wheels go off the track. I'm definitely going to be talking about number five. Uh, it ain't gonna happen, Karen knows this, but anyway, don't wanna put words in Karen's mouth, but we will definitely be talking about this point. Number six, this all needs to culminate into a tipping point so that society demands change. And number seven, we then need leaders who know how to make the necessary legislative changes, even at possible risk of losing their own political standing. 
And of course, number seven is right there with number five. In other words, change is complicated and we need to quit reciting facts as if that is going to work. <laughs> yes. Citing facts. Like uh, people really want to listen to facts. But anyway, we are going to keep reciting the facts and chronicling the collapse uh, of global industrial civilization and the planet on this channel. So uh, if you enjoyed what Karen Schrag had to say in her essays, please spend a few minute, seconds to thumb up this video. If you did not like what Karen had to say, uh, spend a few seconds thumbing it down. And by all means, while you're over here, please subscribe to Collapse Chronicles for more of the same and look for my upcoming interview with Karen Schrag. And it'll either, I might run it this coming up Sunday, sometime in the next one, two, or three weeks. I will be posting that interview with Karen Schrag. But I've got to wrap up this chronicle of the collapse because the little dog and I uh, need to get out there and start uh, whipping this shack into shape so we can move to New York, baby. And I suggest you get out there and enjoy this beautiful springtime 2020 shaping up before summertime comes blowing in. And I got a tick on my little dog. I got to get this tick off my dog. Bye, guys.